All right. Let's start. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Niao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo, and hello all. And welcome and thank you, Simbis people, for joining us the 97th seminar, and I call it on Imperial College London Day. <laughs> Today is also a very special day. Today is the United Nations International Day of Peace. Peace can be anything from simply peace of our mind to the world without conflicts. By giving our time, kind words, empathy, apology, forgiveness, and love, I believe we could make conflicts solved or disappeared in a peaceful way, although it is easier to say so than do so. I hope we'll make a better world or peaceful world together. Okay, it is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Tom Ellis. He does not need any introduction because we all know him. He is a professor at Imperial College London. He has a very interesting journey. After obtaining his PhD degree, he worked at a company followed by his postdoctoral work at the Jim Collins lab, of course, the Symbio father. Given his diverse experience, it is not surprising that his interest in various topics from social issues to scientific problems, also I heard he's also very interested in you know, biotechnology industry as well. Tom, thank you so much for your pioneering work in synthetic biology and more importantly, your contribution to synthetic biology education, including synthetic biology undergraduate module at Imperial, I believe, which helps many future leaders gain hands-on knowledge on this field. Tom, the virtual podium is all yours, and thank you again. Okay, thank you so much. It's great to give a short talk here uh, ahead of uh, a really exciting talk from Antonio that's coming up next. Let me just share my screen um, and then I can begin giving you a bit of introduction here. So hopefully now uh, I'm sharing the screen and you can see yes. uh, my wonderful group. Um, this is us about a month or so ago, enjoying the British countryside. Uh, not too far, maybe an hour and a half or so away from uh, our beautiful location in central London at Imperial College. Uh, we're not by a beach like you are in Scripps in La Jolla, and we're not, you know, on near a beautiful mountain like someone in Switzerland, but we're in one of the most interesting and exciting and historic cities in the middle of, of the world and uh, surrounded by royal parks and some of the world's best museums literally next door that are free for entry, where you can see some of the original things from biology and biotech now on display, such as the first ever lancets used for vaccinations. And I think they even have uh, the first ever bio brick um, distribution in the Science Museum in, in the UK next door. Let me briefly tell you about my lab and give you some highlights of some of the stuff we do. Recently, I put together this multicolored slide that just gives you an idea in one slide of what we do. These are our methods, synthetic genomics, Golden Gate assembly, flow cytometry, nanopore sequencing. The organisms we work with are almost all um, microbes, although we have moved a little bit into mammalian work as well. And more importantly, our research goals are down here on the left and our application goals are on the right. And my group is more or less 40% uh, doing materials by design, 
and 40% looking at synthetic genomes. And we have a, a couple of people looking at how we can get microbes to have multicellular behaviors. And we're particularly interested in the foundational side of synthetic biology. So the, over in red here, these application goals, um, they're, they're not the main focus of what we do. We want to deliver new technologies and new understanding that enables others to do these applications. And I'll give you one little story now uh, in these next few slides that shows how my ignorance <laughs> towards applications can lead to applications, <laughs> thanks to the work of collaborators uh, and particularly the, the talented young people in my group. So the two biggest focus areas in my group are synthetic gen genomes. And the two areas we care most about now, having completed our part of the synthetic yeast genome project, are what comes next. Can we build genomes in a modular fashion? And so we use Saccharomyces cerevisiae to test out this question. Uh, and we take genes from around the genome where they have naturally arisen, and we rearrange those into modules, deleting them from where they lie in the genome, and try to experiment, understand how to design these modules, where to place them, where the chromatin can control them. And now our new question, which is exciting us, is whether we can use generative AI to actually write these entire module sequences based on prior knowledge of, of what bases work well next to one another in promoters, in coding sequences, and in intergenic regions. We are also working in collaboration with others on putting together technologies to go beyond the sort of size that we're up to now in our progression in making larger and larger synthetic DNA constructs and getting up to the entire Baker's yeast genome. If we can carry on this uh, exponential increase in the size of DNA we can design, build, and assemble and get to work inside cells, then within my lifetime as a researcher and hopefully within the lifetime of everyone else here, we should be thinking and seeing the possibilities of synthetic human genomes. But this will require new technologies to bridge these scales, just as old technologies that we have now from the last 20 to 30 years have gotten us up this curve so far. But the other focus is on growing materials from microbes and using synthetic biology to change those material properties. And the reason I'm showing an image of a tree here is to make you think about the possibilities. We get a lot of our biological materials and biomaterials that we use in construction, in clothing. I mean, just look around you right now. How many of these come from plants? A huge amount of them, right? And if you look at a plant like this beautiful tree here in an English forest, one thing that's striking to consider is that all of these different materials that you can see both above the ground and, below, and, and you can imagine below the ground are all made by cells that have exactly the same genome within them. And it's within that genome, there are transcriptional regulatory programs, different enzymes turning on and off in different spaces and in different time to produce polymers and other molecules in different combinations. And those programs turning on and off on those genomes lead to different materials being made with fantastically variable different material properties and functions, but all from the same basic cell with a genome. So we want to know, we, want, we have this long-term ambition of the group to consider how we could do that from the bottom up. And so we don't work with plants. They're far too complex to disentangle, in our opinion, for this aim. We instead work with microbes. But we work with special microbes that are really good at producing a lot of material. And the material that you can see our, our bacteria here churning out is cellulose, which is the basic building block for plants uh, and their cell walls. But here, this is an ultra pure version without things like pectins and lignins mixed in. Uh, so it really provides us uh, something to start from what we would call like a blank piece of paper to begin this project with. This is what these little bugs look like. Uh, we call the one we like to use is called K. radicus. Uh, another popular one used in the community is K. xylanus. And these little guys drink up glucose and other sugars. In fact, they can take in all sorts of waste. 
and about a quarter or a third of that, they just churn out very immediately as these cellulose fibers. They don't actually digest this cellulose back, so they lose it. Um, but it's a, a great use for us. And it's very simple to make. 30 degrees C, three or four days, and you can start producing this layer as long as you have a static culture with oxygen access. Uh, and when you take some of this material and dehydrate it and look at it under a Mic, uh, electron micrograph, then what you see is what you would see if you looked at paper or what you look see if you looked at cotton, which is this interwoven fabric, in this case with little cells stuck in between it, but actually with really strong tensile properties because these are very long fibers compared to the ones you see in plants, and they're much more uniform and pure. So since we had an iGEM project in 2014 with a really talented set of students, We've been exploring engineering materials using this as our bulk material that we make more complex and add new functionalities and new things to it. Our undergraduate students from the iGEM project managed to get a PNAS paper describing a toolkit and a genome sequence for these bacteria and methods to trans transform them and add engineered plasmids into them. And then further people in my group, such as Viv Hoosens, then spent further time improving this. And more recently now we have a Golden Gate toolkit to really enable much more high throughput engineering in this space. Now we've done many projects on this published in all sorts of journals and collaborated with cool people like Tim Liu and people at, at TU Delft now, which is an amazing institute in the Netherlands. But let me just give you a couple of examples here in our remaining minutes. What we do is this overarching question to try and write DNA programs to grow materials that have new change of properties due to the DNA that we put into these cells. These are our cells at the top here. This is our toolkit. And these are generally the different methods you would achieve different material properties. Self-organized structures, composites with other biopolymers, cells in and amongst the material doing living functionalities like responding and repairing, and then enzyme modification, just like plants have enzymes outside the cell that process the cellulose and give it into different structures. We can think of other sort of enzymes that we can get in and amongst the material to change the properties. Just give you a couple of examples of work done in this space with our toolkit. We'd love to do microstructures like honeycomb or Turing patterns. And while we're not quite there yet, we have achieved cell engineered cell to cell signaling um, in and amongst these materials as they grow so that you can do things like have materials that can uh, identify the boundaries between regions as they're growing and trigger gene expression in this case of red fluorescent protein only at those boundaries so that we can have domains within a growing 2d material where we have expression of an of new gene and potentially maybe new polymers in that region only we can cheat as well and not do self-organization whilst we're waiting for great minds to come up with Turing patterns. And we can instead do things like optogenetic patterning. And here we're shining the London underground symbol onto a Petri dish and getting in response just in a region of the growing material, uh, red fluorescent protein production. And actually the PhD student who worked on this, Marcus Walker, did a great job in optimizing it further. And now we have these beautiful uh, ability to do very fine and precise structuring on a growing material in a Petri dish using optogenetics, thanks to his optimizations and innovations. Enzymatic modification can be fun. For example, this is expression of different chroma proteins to give us different pigments of our cellulose. And actually the one of these that is, is in some ways the simplest, but has been the most uh, fun to work on has been expression of a single enzyme called the tyrosinase, which will convert tyrosine into a polymer known as melanin, which we all know is that pigment molecule that you by nature to give UV protection and to give lovely black colors. And this has worked really well for us in, in us enabling to produce this bacterial cellulose material, but now have the altered property that it's a, a different color and probably has uh, in increased protection against radiation. What's kind of cool about this, which I just want to highlight, is that this material color that has been grown by the cells is robust 
to us taking the material and sterilizing it through all sorts of different methods. So with this engineered cell that is expressing this enzyme, we can make a colored material, but we can have fun with it. We can grow this very easily into, into large scales. We can autoclave it, and then we can take it out of the lab and make things out of it. And sure enough, teaming up with others, we did things like grow some of this and turn it into products like a, a laptop carrying case, right? And this is this is can be several years old now, and it's still got its color. So we teamed up with a startup company uh, called Modern Synthesis, who are using bacterial cellulose as a material uh, that could be used as a vegan replacement to leather. Uh, they're founded by a designer, Jen Keen, and a former PhD student of mine, Ben Reeve. And with them, we grew our microbe at scale in one of their molds, and we grew a shoe. <laughs> which I don't think many other Symbio uh, research groups have done, right? But yeah, we grew an actual shoe. And I think one of the coolest things about this was I initially thought, well, this is just a bit of a fun with designers. But actually, there's, a, there's something really smart about this, right? Which is we have made a material and by using GMO, we, haven't then, we don't then have to have this material go through a dying step, which is the logical thing for most materials once you make them, right? Leather is incredibly bad for the environment, but leather plus dyeing leather to make it black, which is by far the most uh, commonly bought color of leather, is even worse for the environment because the dyeing process is a terrible part of, of uh, the pollution involved in making materials. And so in one step with one microbe where we have used GMO to define the color that it gets, uh, we can get rid of that that step and embed this color naturally into a replacement for something like leather that is far more sustainable for the environment. And excitingly, Jen and the team at uh, Modern Synthesis are licensing this IP and taking this microbe a bit further. So I'll end now with just the moral of this story, right? Which is to be the black sheep. <laughs> We don't want to, we, biology enables us to be the black sheep, right? Where when the material is made, you can also put in the genes that then define the color of that material, which is a far more efficient process than the current methods that are used to make things like this black cotton t-shirt that I'm wearing. But also be the black sheep in terms of your research. Don't just get focused on obvious near-term applications. Do the long-term stuff the foundational stuff. And the more crazy applications then can come from that. And you might find and be surprised like I am that actually they're quite useful <laughs> and they are quite um, compelling reasons for, for crazy things like growing a black shoe. Okay, I'll finish up there. Um... What wonderful, wonderful. So, you know, you are a few people I know basically start from the very fundamental research all the way to real product. And then that's why, you know, I call you, you know, pioneer because this is amazing. I mean, so, I mean, I, I, I thinking about, you know, material, you know, biomaterial research. And then, but I thought when I, maybe everybody wanted to work on that one, I thought that is still very, early stage, but you already kind of make something out of that one. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much. This is a brilliant talk. I, I love it. <laughs> no okay. worries. So uh, now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction, Dr. Antonio Del Leo Flores was born in a small town in Mexico that is of famous for their uh, artisan crafts and regional cuisine. Antonio subsequently moved to the United States at a young age and grew up in a Bay Area. He attended the University of California, Davis, and received a double major degree in chemical and biochemical engineering. His undergraduate research span the field of bioprocess engineering, process control uh, simulations, plant biology, and metabolomics. 
He recently completed his doctoral study at the University of California, Berkeley in chemical and biomolecular engineering under Wen Jun Zhang. His research deals with studying the biosynthesis and enzymology associated with natural products from environmental bacteria and human pathogens. His efforts led to advances in understanding the biogenesis of functional groups that are widely utilized for bioorthogonal transformation in chemical biology. Antonio recently joined Kaitan Kosla's research group at Stanford as a Stanford Science Postdoctoral Fellow and plans to study host mic interactions with relevance to nocardiosis. He will start as a, an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder in 2025 in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Antonio was also my official mentee through the AICH Mentor Mentee Program, and I am super glad and honored to see him secure a faculty position even before conducting his postdoc research. Antonio, congratulations again, and thank you for your time today, and please take it away. Thank you, Taysuk, for the very kind introduction. It's an honor today to be giving my talk, especially after Tom's excellent talk as well. Um, thank you again for developing this platform for young speakers and being able to um, have them share their research. I think this is very, very important things to have. And with that, yeah, I'd like to go ahead and get started. So um, today I'll be giving a talk uh, where we're gonna be focusing on the biosynthesis of natural products, having bioorthogonal functional groups. This is work done during my PhD with Wen Jun Zhang. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So in this lab, what I studied are natural products. These are specialized metabolites that are produced by microbes and plants. And they're produced to um, mediate a variety of different types of biological and ecological processes. For example, um, to satisfy nutrient acquisition, um, interference competition, as well as virulence. But really the reason why we care about them as human beings is that we've leveraged them for thousands of years uh, to treat a variety of different types of human health conditions. So here I give you the example of, uh, we have penicillin, which is one type of antibiotic. And then we also have um, other things like paclitaxel that has been used to treat different types of cancers. And we have artemisinin, which is your typical anti-malarial agent. And one astonishing uh, statistic I'd like to point out is that 60% of all drugs that have been approved by the FDA are either natural products or have been inspired by a natural product scaffold. So with that, I'd like to also bring up is another of the biggest reasons that really drew me into natural product research is that as an engineer, um, I related to um, some of the engineering feats that have been um, that have been employed in natural product research, such as a commercialization of, of penicillin, which was key during World War II. And what I'd like to also point out that within the natural product field, um, they the Nobel Prize was awarded three different individuals for their discoveries of different types of molecules, such as artemisinin and ivermectin. Ivermectin being an example of an antiparasitic agent. And within the realm of natural products, I focus specifically on um, natural products that have a bioorthogonal functional group. So first I'd like to go over what is bioorthogonal chemistry? Well, it relates to a series of chemical reactions that um, result in high yield, occur at a fast rate, and are selective towards specific functionalities in the biological environment. And importantly, there's negligible to no reactivity towards endogenous functional groups. And really, it's emerged as one of the most powerful tools in chemical biology, as evidenced with a recent Nobel Prize award to Carolyn Bertosi for her development of bioorthogonal chemistry to label um, cells in vivo and for cancer biology applications. Within the realm of natural products, um, the reason why we care about um, bioorthogonal chemistry is that if we're able to successfully take these bioorthogonal functional groups, so here I give you an example of a terminal alkyne and an azide, 
if we're able to install these into natural products and react them with their cognate um, by orthogonal chemistry pairs, we're able to use them, we're able to take the product and utilize it for a variety of different types of applications. If we generate specific fluorophore, we can use it for visualization purposes, or we can use it to study the mode of action of a specific uh, natural product. And really one of the issues here with using this approach is being able to install these bioorthogonal handles. Um, there are three different methods to um, do it. The first one is through synthetic chemistry, where you can um, take the precursor and then install it into a natural product through thermal synthesis. Or another alternative is through precursor directed biosynthesis. This is where you take, where you know the biosynthetic pathway for a specific small molecule. And what you do is you feed in a precursor. And if the biosynthetic machinery is um, promiscuous enough, it can get incorporated into the final scaffold. But for today's talk, I'm going to be focusing on the last bullet point here, which is de novo biosynthesis. This is where you use an enzyme to install the functionality onto a specific small molecule. And I think this is a better strategy than the previous ones because enzymes offer selectivity as well as it mitigates a lot of the background is associated with precursor directed biosynthesis. And for, for today's talk, what I want to do is I want to focus on a specific um, two specific functionalities that I've been working on. The first one that we're going to be focusing on is on the isonitrile functionality, which is an example of a bioorthogonal functional group. It's actually found in over 250 characterized natural products. Some of these natural products are quite interesting. SF2768 is a molecule that scavenges for copper, similar to Severifor, which scavenges for iron, and it's important for streptomyces species to um, get extracellular copper from the environment. From a reactivity standpoint, isonitriles are quite interesting because they participate in multi-component reactions such as the Ugi and Passerini reactions. And what I want to point out is that, as I mentioned before, they're an example of an, a functionality that um, can participate in biorthogonal chemistry with reactions with tetrazines. And these can be used to generate these pi amino pyrazole motifs that can be used for a variety of different types of applications. For nearly two decades, what I want to point out that in nature, there was only one known enzymatic pathway to generate these isonitrile molecules. And this was characterized by these things called isonitrile A synthases, which um, are shown right here. And what they basically do is that they catalyze a condensation reaction between ribulose 5-phosphate from primary metabolism with the alpha amino group of either tryptophan here or tyrosine to install, to install this isonitrile functionality. So in my laboratory, we actually studied a conserved biosynthetic gene cluster. And um, this gene cluster is found in mycobacterium tuberculosis, the leading causative agent of tuberculosis. So this uh, BGC is RB97 through 101. And what we found is this BGC was widespread amongst pathogenic mycobacteria, but absent from non-pathogenic mycobacteria. And what I also want to point out is that this BGC was also found in other genera within the actinobacteria phyla, for example, streptomyces and nocardia. And part of the motivation why we wanted to even study this BGC or biosynthetic gene cluster to begin with was that a plethora of different biological studies were conducted. And ultimately, in common, what they were able to show is that if we knock out any of the genes with, from this biosynthetic gene cluster, uh, for example, here I'm showing you a transposon insertion at RB97, this attenuated bacterial growth in mouse model infection indicating that whatever's being made by this set of genes is a virulence product that's associated with some type of virulence factor. So at this point in our laboratory, what we did is that we took the five genes from Streptomyces seroluvidus and we expressed them in, in E. coli, and we were able to find that they make this family of natural products called isonitrile lipopeptides. And what I want to point out is that these isonitrile lipopeptides were later shown in the uh, future work that they... Um, then um, after some modification, they actually um, chelate to copper and they're used as a mechanism for streptomyces to um, scavenge for copper. Um, and another research group was able to show that mycobacterium tuberculosis also produces very similar isonitrile lipopeptides as shown here, with the one difference is that they have longer alkyl chains on either side of these isonitrile moieties. But what I want to bring your attention to today, again, is on the main focus, which is the de novo biosynthesis of, of bioorthogonal functional groups. So here in red, I have boxed one of the enzymes that I want 
to focus on today, and that is SCOE, which is an enzyme that converts this molecule CABA into the isonitrile containing small molecule INBA, and being able to understand a little bit about the mechanism associated for isonitrile formation. So with that, um, this is just as a reminder, the reaction catalyzed by SCOE, it converts this molecule CABA to INBA. SCOE is annotated as a non-heme iron 2 alpha KG dependent dioxygenase. In short, what that means is that it uses mononuclear iron to mediate different types of oxidative chemistry. It requires molecular oxygen and alpha KG to undergo a catalytic cycle to conduct uh, a round of oxidation. Initially, what we wanted to do is to conduct rigorous product analyses to determine the reaction stoichiometry associated with this reaction. And what we observed from our stoichiometry experiments was that two equivalents of alpha KG and oxygen were required to generate one equivalent of isonitrile. This was something that at first we were a little bit puzzled, but you know, looking back between the comparison between Kaba to Imba, we observed that if we want to convert this to isonitrile, this entails a four electron oxidation. Most of the time with this enzyme superfamily, after one alpha KG half reaction, this includes a two electron oxidation. Thus, it was conceivable that two equivalents of alpha KG would be required to explain this four electron oxidation chemistry. And furthermore, we were able to also show that this carbon here is lost through carbon dioxide. And in collaboration with Kathy Drennan, MIT, and also Heather Kulik, we were able to solve several crystal structures of SCOE both with and without ligands, and ultimately gave us some idea about some of the interactions of um, Kaba and other substrates within the active site. And what I want to do today is just kind of highlight some of the main features, because a lot of work went into this with this great collaboration with Kathy Drennan and Heather Kulik. But ultimately, what we found from our structural, biochemical, and computational analysis, that there are these three residues, which are highlighted here, lysine-193, histidine-299, and arginine-157, that undergo conformational changes during the catalytic cycle of SCOE. Ultimately, what happens is that when Kaba comes into the active site, this lysine-193 moves into the active site and interacts with the carboxylate of Kaba. And then what's, I think, even more interesting is that we have these other two residues here, um, which is the histidine and the arginine, is that they're initially pointing away from the active site and they move a total of 10 angstroms into the active site to sequester the alpha KG in this binding site. And this is something that was unprecedented within this enzyme superfamily. And we think this is something that's biologically relevant because um, if you notice alpha KG shown right here, it looks very similar to Kaba in the sense that um, it, has two, uh, it has this carboxylic acid here. So therefore it's conceivable that some type of um, inducible alpha KG binding site might be required since this two subjects look very similar. But ultimately we were able to get some basis for the structural um, interrogation for isonitrile formation. But at this point, our next goal was to be able to study the reaction mechanism to figure out what were the bios what were the um, intermediates that were required to be able to proceed through isonitrile formation. What we ended up doing is we had a strategy in which we chemically synthesize a carbon-13 labeled version of our substrate kava. We label this carbon here that I have asterisk right here. And we subject, we perform in vitro assays with purified enzymes, and we analyze them with NMR. And from our NMR analysis, we were able to arrive at two unique signals that we attributed to arise from compounds one and two. Compound one is a hydroxylated version of kava. And then compound two is the two electron oxidized version of kava and forms this imine right here. Interesting, what we found is that if we analyze the same reaction, but now incubated for an overnight period, the signal associated with compound one disappeared and we were able to arrive at three other unique um, signals associated with three new compounds. So we were still able to see our imine right here. So now we were able to observe this compound three, um, which we hypothesized was a degradation product of the isonitrile, and then these new compounds, compounds four and five. So as you would imagine now, our next goal was now to figure out, okay, we detect these, these new products from this reaction, which of these are on pathway intermediates, and which of these are shunt products or perhaps degradation products. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the salient features from our work, um, and then um, kind of summarize everything for you at the very end. Luckily for us, what we were able to do is that we were able to chemically synthesize compound two, which is the two electron oxidized version of kava. Uh, we were able to synthesize this in the trans configuration, 
And we're able to show that if we feed it to the enzyme, we can actually generate the isonitrile upon um, performing a biorthogonal chemical reaction with tetrazine to generate this, um, this addict product pyaminopyrazole. And ultimately what this suggested was that compound two is an intermediate towards isonitrile formation and um, serves as kind of the middle point en route to isonitrile formation. However, as you would imagine, um, there were some um, off pathway intermediates here. And as a spoiler, we were able to show that compounds four and five were off pathway intermediates. Let's talk a little bit about some of our evidence here. So what we reason is that after we generate this imine, the second alpha KG can come in and hydroxylate, again, the C5 position, and this molecule compound four can undergo tautomerization to generate compound five. And what we observed is that from our time course analysis is that compound four did not really get consumed over an overnight period, thus suggesting that it was perhaps not an intermediate. Instead, it was a, a dead a shunt product. And another line of evidence that we also had was that this compound five, we were able to chemically synthesize it. When we fed it back into scope, we, we were unable to generate the isonitrile, thus also suggesting that compound five is not an intermediate towards isonitrile formation. But as with all, as with always, we want to cover all our tracks uh, when we're doing science. So we had another great collaboration with Heather Kolick at MIT, and they performed DFTQM cluster calculations in which we assumed that compound four was an intermediate towards isonitrile formation. So they calculated the transition states and energies of all the proposed intermediates. And what I want to bring your attention to is that this energy level right here is associated with compound four. And this energy level here is associated with our final isonitrile product. As you can see, this potential intermediate sits at an energy level that's even lower than the product, thus making this really not um, favorable from an energetic standpoint. If you compare this to our proposed mechanism, which I'll talk about in the next slide, you can see that the whole entire energy landscape goes downhill. But ultimately, I think what I want to highlight here is just another great um, you know, example about how you can put together experimental and computational findings to be able to explain certain, certain different types of findings in this field. And this is one of the great things about you know, having people that you can work with and you know, discuss these very difficult topics with. So, after going through a few other biochemical characterization, we were able to propose a mechanism that was consistent with both our experimental, uh, computational, as well, as well as structural data. And it appears that isonitrile formation um, begins by um, the first alpha KG reaction in which we hydroxylate the carbon right here to generate the hemiaminol compound one that we observed from our NMR experiments. Then our results actually indicate that there's an amino acid residue tyrosine 96 that helps aid in the dehydration to generate compound two. This is the one that we were able to show that if we feed it back into SCOE, it can generate the isonitrile. This molecule can go through this off-pathway hydroxylation, but what our results actually indicate is that instead, second alpha KG comes in and instead it proceeds through a radical base uh, decarboxylation to generate the isonitrile moiety here, which is our terminal product. And this terminal product can undergo water-based dehydration to generate this formamide product, which we also detected from an NMR analysis. A couple of things I want to point out here, a lot of chemistry here, but ultimately one of the things that we wanted to figure out is what happens when there's excess alpha KG. Because as I mentioned before, we need two alpha KG equivalents in order to generate one equivalent of isonitrile. What we found is that when we have three times excess, compared to one time excess, we end up seeing production more of this off-pathway hydroxylation. And at this moment, we also conducted some um, kinetic um, product formation analyses. And we found that although this off-pathway hydroxylation is occurring, and also this degradation of isonitrile is also occurring, that it cannot outcompete the main pathway. And ultimately what I wanna highlight is that this enzyme is actually quite interesting. It um, catalyzes two distinct CH bond functionalization steps. One is through C5 hydroxylation, and the second is through radical base decarboxylation. And this is all mediated through this mononuclear center, uh, iron center, which is really interesting. So at this moment, as you would imagine, we have some solid evidence about isonitrile formation from this enzyme from Streptomyces. So now what we wanted to do is move, go back to our mycobacterial system. And ultimately what we wanted to figure out was to get some insight into the substrate specificity of 
um, these isonitrile forming enzymes. So we expressed and purified RV97, which is a homologue of SCOE from Mycobacterium tuberculosis. MMAE is a homologue from Mycobacterium marinum. And what we ended up doing is that we performed an enzymatic cascade where we generated a bunch of different kava analogs. So if you remember, kava ha has four carbons here. So we generated analogs between C4 to C16, and then we spiked in different isonitrile forming enzymes, SCOE, RV97, MMAE. And ultimately what we were able to find from here is that these enzymes had quite a bit different substrate specificity. SCOE recognized alkyl chains between C4 to C8, but it actually um, preferred to have shorter chain substrates, C4, um, as we would expect. But these mycobacterial enzymes recognize um, alkyl chains, which were much longer, C8 all the way C16. It seemed to prefer even longer ones, C16 being the, the most preferred, at least from our tested panel. So given, you know, you know, given a, a lot of with my perhaps with my background in engineering, one of the things that I was very interested in is why is there a substrate specificity difference? And ultimately, I wanted to figure out what is dictating this substrate specificity difference. So one thing that was very nice, again, thanks to our collaboration with um, Kathy Drennan and MIT, we had crystal structures of SCOE. So I ended up looking at the active site of SCOE, and I what drew through my attention was this residue here, phenylalanine-239, that seemed to be interacting with the alkyl chain of, um, of, um, of kava found in SCOE. And after performing a sequence alignment between SCOE and its homologs, what we found is that instead of having a phenylalanine here for RV97 and MMAE, instead we had a glycine. So my hypothesis was quite simple, that perhaps maybe this phenylalanine here is preventing the alkyl chain from being longer because it's actually interacting with the molecule. So naturally, what we can do at this point is we can do, we can alter this phenylalanine into an alanine. And what we were able to see is that when we mutate this, uh, when we alter this residue, is that now SCOE can recognize a C10 version of kava, although not the, at the same level as the wild type. And conversely, we can do the opposite experiment where we take one of the mycobacterial enzymes and originally has a glycine. If we turn it into a phenylalanine, voila, now we can recognize these shorter chain substrates. And ultimately, we are very like uh, we are very happy with these results. And ultimately, this is kind of uh, an example of an ongoing collaboration that we have with Kathy Drennan. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to further understand is why we're not on what other residues in the active site are potentially also responsible for substrate specificity. Because one of the things that you notice from here is that although we're able to change the specificity, we did not restore the wild type activity. So. Right now, we're currently um, collaborating with Dr. Drennan to be able to obtain a crystal structure of RV97 and MMAE with the substrate bound to be able to understand a little bit more about um, the requirements for substrate specificity. But at least we were able to show that one of these residues um, did make the switch um, just from our uh, homology modeling and looking at the active site of a homologue of RV97. So with that, that was great. We as I mentioned before, there are two different types of enzymatic machinery um, that um, in nature have been discovered so far um, to install this isonitrile functionality. What I want to point out, uh, another very popular um, biorthogonal handle that's used a lot in biorthogonal chemistry is the terminal alkyne. There are two examples of terminal alkyne biosynthetic machinery. The one here on top here was also discovered in Wenjun's lab. Um, the jam ABC system, we have this membrane bound desaturase that oxidizes this fatty acid on an acyl carrier protein to generate the terminal alkyne. And the second kind of terminal alkyne biosynthetic machinery was discovered by Michelle Chang, also at UC Berkeley, um, which, which is part of the biosynthetic pathway of l beta thionyl serine. But ultimately, for the last part of my PhD, what I was very interested in was seeing if there was a way to enzymatically produce an azide, which is one of the most important functional groups in biorthogonal chemistry. And this is, it, it's really well known for its reaction with terminal alkynes to generate triazoles. And ultimately, what I wanted to answer is, is there a way to enzymatically produce this azide? This is something that hasn't been done in a de, de novo basis. There have been enzymes that can catalyze azide transfer, but not construct the whole entire thing de novo. 
So ultimately, my strategy was to look into the literature and see if there are any natural products that have an azide. And it turns out that, at least for my search, there's one natural product that seemed to have this terminal azide. And the name of this molecule is called ATPH. And it's found from a dinoflagellate that's found in the Gulf of Mexico called Carinia brevis. We tried culturing this organism in our laboratory. Unfortunately, we tried many different conditions. We were unable to produce, um, we were unable to um, observe any production of this ATPH molecule. So as you would imagine, this caused a hamper in my plans. And we really went through a very long roadblock. Um, but right now, just keep in mind that um, the interest here is finding a way to enzymatically synthesize this azide. So we decided to move on to a different system. And the system that I want to talk about is the triacins. So the triacins are a family of natural products that were discovered from this bacteria here called Streptomyces orophaciens. This was discovered back in the 1980s. And um, this family of natural products in common have this 11 carbon alkyl chain. And then they have this terminal n hydroxytriazine functionality consisting of three consecutive nitrogens and an oxygen. So as you can see, in some ways it's similar to the azide in the sense that it has three nitrogens. Um, and uh, the only difference, one of the only differences being that there's this terminal hydroxyl group. So because of this, what we thought is that perhaps if we understood how these three nitrogens come together biosynthetically, it can give us some insight into how azide formation could potentially be catalyzed by nature. And apart from that, I also want to point out that NN bonds are another hot topic a lot in the scientific community right now, because 3% of all approved drugs have an NN bond. And this is something that might not seem very impressive, but it turns out that less than 0.1% of all characterized natural products have an NN bond. So what we observe here is like a 34 enrichment in bioactive molecules here. And some of these drugs are really important. Um, as you may recall, isoniacin and rifampicin are frontline anti-TB drugs. Thus, I think there's a lot of merit being able to study the enzymes that are responsible for these different types of chemical transformations. So, in short, um, I want to summarize some of our work with our triacins, just because I don't think it's central to, to, to today's talk, uh, with the exception of one enzymatic reaction. But ultimately, we were able to identify the triacin biosynthetic gene cluster. We generated in the order of 30 knockouts. We characterized one biosynthetic intermediate from our knockouts. And we were able to express, purify, and characterize 15 different enzymes and we were able to propose a biosynthetic pathway for the different triacin congeners that were originally discovered in that paper from the 1980s. But what I want you to focus on right now is just one enzyme here, which I have boxed in red, which is TRI-17. TRI-17 was annotated as an acyl-CoA ligase. What we found is that it's an ATP utilizing enzyme that activates, that uses ATP to activate nitrite that is produced by tri-16 and tri-21 from the pathway to N-nitrosate this acyl hydrozone to generate the n hydroxytriazine functionality, which is an N-nitrosated intermediate. Ultimately, we were able to biochemically characterize the tri-17 by using a surrogate substrate. We were able to show that we can generate triacin A in that the reaction the ATP is hydrolyzed into AMP and pyrophosphate as the major products. But one of the key questions, again, this is all great and everything, we were able to show that um, we can generate the N-hydroxytriazine functionality. But ultimately, we wanted to test what is the biocatalytic potential of TRI-17? Can it perform novel chemistry in the context of azide formation? So let's talk a little bit about this. So the next few slides, I'll be talking about some of the work that is currently under review. It's unpublished, but um, this, this, I'm very excited to talk about this today. Um, what we wanted to do is to test um, a different pool of substrates to be able to gauge the promiscuity of TRI-17. So we tested a pool of different alkyl and heterocyclic substrates. And these substrates varied in alkyl chain length, degrees of unsaturation. And then we also tested five membered rings and six membered rings. And to our surprise, TRI-17 was very, very, very promiscuous. It seemed to accept all these different substrates and we determined their kinetic parameters. And as you would imagine, um, based off of the catalytic efficiencies, um, we were able to show that um, TRI-17 preferred longer chain hydrozones as you would expect because it's closer to the native substrate of TRI-17, which is this acyl hydrozone that, uh, that I showed you in the previous slide. And one of the things I wanna highlight that um, about 
I would say in the order about two or three months after our uh, we published our paper on TRI-17, another research group discovered a TRI-17 homologue called AHA-11. And what they were able to show is that AHA-11 um, instead recognized this aryl amine substrate and also um, utilized ATP and nitride to install this thing called a diazo functionality. And this diazo functionality was really interesting because um, they, they've they um, proposed that it went through an n nitrosate intermediate like TRI-17, but what this would indicate is that this would um, be caused through dehydration to generate this um, oxidized product. So one of the things that we were curious is what happens if we replace AHA level with TRI-17? Can it do the same chemistry? And ultimately, we were able to show that indeed TRI-17 can catalyze the same chemistry as its homologue AHA11 and generate the same diazo molecule. So at that moment, we were very excited because this indicated that TRI17 can also potentially accommodate dehydration after the um, N-nitrosation reaction. So at this moment, what we were curious about is what we took a dive into studying a little bit about um, the homologs of SCOE. So we conducted what's known as a sequence similarity network analysis. And what we observed from this analysis that TRI-17 here colored in red seemed to be in a different cluster than its homologues CREM and AHA-11, thus potentially explaining why TRI-17 had this very broad substrate specificity. And um, we were very curious by this. And ultimately we went back to the beginning question, is there a way that we can take this enzyme TRI-17 and perhaps modify a substrate such that we can trick it into, after generating this N-hydroxy triazine molecule, such that it can dehydrate to generate the azide functionality. So ultimately, that was the fundamental question that we wanted to answer. Is there a way that we can design a substrate so that we can generate this highly coveted synthon here? So as with all things, one of the things that I really tell young people is that um, in, in nature, nature is the best chemist and they've already found solutions to some of the most difficult reactions known to humankind. So when I thought about designing this type of um, substrate, I again looked at the one and only natural product known to have an azide functionality. And based off its chemical structure, I kind of worked backwards. I did what's known as retrobiosynthesis and thought about, hey, what type of substrate can we feed in to generate this azide? So I decided to choose this substrate, compound 17, which is called hydrolazine. You might know hydrolazine as an antihypertensive drug. It's used to treat high blood pressure. And what we were able to find is when we feed compound 17 to TRI-17 with nitride ATP and all the cofactors, that we were able to generate two new products. And fruitfully for us, we were able to show that these corresponded to an N-nitrosated intermediate and the terminal azide, which is what we were looking for. And we were very happy about this. And we were able to show that compound 18 is transiently produced, shown by this green bar here. And the amount of azide increases over the six hour period. And at this point, we were able to show that TRI-17 can catalyze azide formation. But there were still a couple of things that I wanted to um, further investigate. Going back to the natural product ATPH, I now wanted to, now that we know that TRI-17 catalyzes azide formation, is there a way that we can synthesize this really um, compact and nitrogen rich natural product? So my hypothesis was the following. If we take hydrolysine and we add an extra hydrazine subunit, perhaps TRI-17 can generate one azide on one side, and then perhaps the TRI-17 can catalyze another azide formation on the other side, to have the symmetric azide. And this would trigger intramolecular rearrangement to generate this tetrazole motif, which is found here in this natural product. And ultimately we tested our hypothesis and indeed we were able to show that if we feed in compound 23, the major product was this compound 24 with a single azide, but ultimately we were able to show that TRI-17 can also take this compound to generate ATPH, which is the natural product that has the only known natural product that has azide functionality. And one of the things that we wanted to also um, test was if you look at the symmetric azide unit versus the cy cyclized asymmetric unit, they have the same mass to charge ratio. So we wanted to kind of eliminate the possibility that we were just generating double azide intermediates. 
So what we did is we performed copper-free click chemistry and we were able to show that um, indeed we were only producing one azide from compound 25 and we were indeed generating compound 25, which is ATPH. And we were very happy about this, but ultimately there was still one more unanswered question that I had uh, with regards to azide formation. So ultimately, if you go back to this slide here, one of the things that we wanted to um, get some idea is whether the conversion from 18 to 19 is enzyme facilitated or if it happens spontaneously. And the way that we tested this um, these possibilities is that we were able to solve the crystal structure of tri-17 in its APO form. Um, this is what it looks like here. This is the, the N-terminal region. This is the C-terminal region. And unfortunately, we were unable to get any substrate bound structure, but given the homology, of these enzymes to other characterized um, structures of ANL superfamily enzymes, we were able to do some structural modeling and we were able to identify this residue called histidine 229 that we predicted may participate in the dehydration process. So this is the residue here. What we ended up doing is that we took this histidine 229 and we altered it into a phenylalanine and then we acidate using compound 17. And as we expected, we were unable to generate any azide and we observe accumulation of n nitrosated intermediate compound 18, thus suggesting its role in the dehydration process. To further um, cement this uh, finding, we did another experiment in which we performed an in vitro biochemical assay with wild type tri-17, and then we call this our T equals zero point, and then we um, basically um, had a point where we had X amount of azide formation and then what we ended up doing is that we fed in new enzyme after extracting the metabolites. And what we found is that when you add fresh enzyme, compound more compound 18 is being converted to compound 19 and azide formation is occurring. And this is something that's not representative when we omit the enzyme or when we put in the variant. But ultimately here, what I want to point out is that this gave some compelling evidence that histine 229 plays a role in the dehydration process to convert compound 18 to 19, which is our azide. And what I'd like to end today's talk is to end with the proposed mechanism for azide formation. Based off of our experiments, it appears that azide formation is a multi-step process in which tri-17 first acts by activating ATP to generate a nitroso AMP intermediate. This nitroso AMP intermediate is attacked by nucleophilically by compound 17, and undergoes further tautomerization to generate this n nitrosated intermediate. This is where histidine 229 comes in and it helps in the dehydration process of 18 to finally generate compound 19 through acid based catalysis. Very simple catalysis here. But ultimately, here, what I want to point out is through all this, um, going through this detour, we we're able to um, characterize an enzyme that catalyzes azide formation for the first time in the field of natural products. And we were able to show that this is kind of another broad utility of using enzymes to perform unnatural biosynthesis. And this is part of the reason why that motivated me to be able to um, conduct these different studies. And with that, um, I'd like to end today's talk by thanking um, Wenjun and my laboratory for their support. Wenjun's a great advisor. None of this would have been possible without her. I'd like to thank our great collaborators, um, the Kolik and Drennan Lab, both at MIT. I'd like to thank my funding sources. And again, I'd like to give another thing to Taste, another help, another uh, shout out. And uh, I'd like to thank Taysuk for organizing Synbis and also thank you to Tom today. And at this moment, I'm very grateful to have given this talk to everyone here. And I'm happy to answer any questions at this point. Amazing talk, amazing talk. You know, I my background undergraduate is basically chemistry, so I enjoy a lot. So uh let me start with one question that's uh more synthetic biology question. So you kind of uh show the one slide that's kind of changing specificity of the protein or enzyme. And I still, you know, that that type of protein engineering done well, several decades, but still, to me, the engineering, you know, specificity is something like art rather than science. And there are, of course, two ways to do so. One is the, you know, nowadays alpha fold based, yeah. whatever AI based predictive, you know, engineering, 
or a line uh, assisted, whatever method you kind of use. Uh, also, the other way would be directed evolution to find something. What would be your perspective in the future, let's say 10 years from now, uh, how are we going to do that? Right. So that's a great question. So ultimately, at least my perspective is that, you know, AlphaFold is getting better and better nowadays. So I think in the future, we're going to be able to, um, people are going to be able to uh, have better predictions of all these 3D structures of enzymes and be able to potentially even have um, some insight in how the substrate is going to bind. And this is really going to help out the field a lot because a lot of times certain enzymes like, like this one here is very complicated to get substrate bound structures. So sometimes we have to rely on computation and other different types of arts to get some insight into what is potentially happening. I think rational engineering will always be something that is going to be utilized in the field. Um, just given the fact that, um, you know, there's a lot of different structures that are um, in the database and PDB, and there are a high similarity between a lot of different enzyme classes. So it's kind of like the first step where you can do some homology modeling, do some alignments and get some idea of some potential residues that you can test in immediately. But really, I think that um, in the future, computational approaches with alpha full are going to become a little bit more important um, moving forward. But I think that having access to both of them are really important in various different types of applications. Wonderful. So I now see 1106 of my club and let's close uh, officially and then we chat in, you know, you know, offline, yeah. uh, you know, after, you know, stop recording. Okay. So thank you all for joining and staying today. We'll meet again next week on September 28th. Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Professor Patrick Kai at the University of Manchester, UK, another UK professor, and Professor Leo Green at Purdue University. As usual, the follow informal chat will occur with our recording. Please stay here if you are interested in chatting with us, and I'll promote you to panelists who can speak and show your hands up and pretty faces if you wish. And I thanks you again, you know, uh, I stopped recording. Just give me one second.